Hi everybody and thank you for joining me today uh, on this webinar on how to use Construction Line to win new work. My name is Lily and I head up the customer success team here at Construction Line and my goal is to support my team of customer success managers in helping you to achieve your goals and achieve success. And whilst there are many goals that our customers have, the goal of how to win new work using Construction Line is one that comes up time and time again in every conversation that I have had with, with our customers. Now, some of you on this webinar will have been with us for many years, and some will be entirely new to the platform. But irrespective of how long you've been with us, there may be parts of your profile that you may need to update to make the biggest impact and to help you win that new work. So my goal for this webinar is to, uh, is to arm you with those practical tips that you can take away immediately after this webinar and put in place within your profile. Now, there are quite a few people attending this webinar and I want to allow for as many questions as possible. Um, but I'm not going to necessarily be able to answer every single one of them. So um, there are a number of uh, uh, members of my team on, on this uh, webinar as well who are available and ready to answer questions that, that you have as the webinar goes on. So please, please feel free to ask whatever questions you have. Use the Q&A part of the technology rather than the chat. Uh, the chat is, is disabled, so you actually won't be able to ask any questions. But if you go through the Q&A, members of my team will be able to answer those questions. We will also, at the end of this, uh, provide a, an FAQ with some of the most commonly asked questions. We, we anticipate there will be a few um, and some links to the documents that I'm going to refer to as we go. Um, if you have any problems, again, pop it in the Q&A and uh, a number of uh, people are there ready to, to help you should we need it. And this is a recorded webinar, so if you have to jump away or if a colleague wasn't able to attend, uh, you can also share it with them afterwards. So I'm going to cover six things today. How buyers use construction line or how and why buyers use construction line. I'm going to cover some of the things that buyers look for when they source new suppliers. I'm also going to cover what buyers see of your profile. And then what I'll do is I'll cover those practical tips on how you can improve your profile and then why it's so important to do so. And finally, we'll cover a little bit about Marketplace Find and how you can use that to win new work. Now your construction line profile is a way for you to sell yourself and your capabilities and skills to buyers. And what you do in your construction line profile is visible to buyers. So it's really important to get it right. It is essentially like a shop window. So how much or how little information you put in there is ultimately up to you. It's, it's your prerogative of what information you do put on there. But your profile may genuinely be the reason as to why a buyer does or doesn't invite you to a tender. So what you want to be doing is everything you possibly can to make your profile stand out from your next leading competitor. From the buyer's perspective, they use Construction Line to help them source new suppliers for gaps in their supply chain or for new projects that maybe they, they don't have suppliers within that part of the country. They use it to manage their existing supply chain. So some of our bigger buyers have huge supply chains. And so they use the technology to help them manage the compliance of those existing suppliers. But ultimately, in both of those cases, what they're doing is managing their risk. Now, we know that it might seem like an endless set of requirements that you need to be updating that constantly expire. And we do appreciate it can be challenging to get yourself verified and to manage that. But from the buyer's perspective, for every item that isn't verified, it's an increased layer of risk for their projects. 
it's a future problem. It's a future injury and a future delay. And they're constantly weighing up those risks of their supply chain. And what you want to be doing is presenting yourself as the least possible risk to their project. Now let's look at what the buyers look for when they source those new suppliers and, and what's really important to them. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive list. So please, um, you know, don't, don't quote me. I'm not gonna be talking about costs or anything like that, but this is from the conversations I've had from buyers. These are the things that they tell me are really important when they're sourcing for new suppliers. So the first thing they look at is, are you based in the right location? You know, how much travel are you likely to have between where you're based and, and where the project is? You know, there may be requirements to use local suppliers. So it may be quite important that your offices are based in that local area. Then they look at whether you have the right skills. Do you have the right experience to deliver the work that they're asking for? Do you have examples or case studies of the work that you've delivered in the past? And sometimes, depending on the size of the project, you know, are you even capable of delivering the scale of the project that they require? Then they ask themselves, are you going to be financially viable for the duration of the project? You know, they are genuinely asking themselves whether you're going to go out of business halfway through the project. Then it's about insurances. Do you, do you have the appropriate insurance to be on site for that particular project? And then what kind of health risk do you pose? Do you have the appropriate health and safety measures in place that will help them identify how much of a risk you pose? Those buyers have to do their due diligence to safeguard not only their project, but the other people on site, the other subcontractors that you may be affecting. And some buyers are looking for suppliers that demonstrate their social value. The government recently introduced the Social Value Act, where there is a 10% weighting now for uh, social value and all public sector procurement. So it's really important as well for them that the suppliers they use have social value for, for, the, for certain projects. Now, We've covered some of the key areas where the buyers are looking for. So what I want to show you now is what the buyers actually see of your profile. So the next set of slides are screenshots from the buyer's perspective. This is what they see of, of your profile. Now, when a buyer either searches for your company directly or looks you up as part of a specific search, so they might be looking for uh, particular services and you've appeared, this is the first thing that they see. So this is a, a genuine screenshot of a supplier's account. We've redacted some of the key information to, so, so that you don't see who they are. Um, but what this shows you is right from the very beginning, they can see what plan level you are on and whether or not you are verified. They will then also see a summary and an overview of your company details. All of the information on this screen that you see is information that can be updated in your company profile. So either be it uh, financials, uh, be it details from company's house or the company profile, which is a free flowing uh, text box within the identity section. As you then scroll down on that same screen, there's a slightly more detailed breakdown of the different levels and whether or not you are verified. So in this particular example, this particular supplier is verified to gold. I can see they don't, they're not verified with their SSIP claim, but they do have a DTS. And they have also completed their social value question set. They can then see your office location. So if you have a headquarters, if you have branch offices, the addresses will be visible to the buyers in this section. Then as we continue, they will see who you have set as the primary contact, as well as the individuals in your company directory. So this is the combined group of users and contacts that you have provided through your profile in a summary. So all of the different contacts. 
and they'll be able to see the. You can't see in the screenshot again. We've redacted the information, but you do see names and emails and telephone numbers in here as well. Then separately, in a similar way as you can see within the issues tab, what items you have unverified and which ones are due to expire, the buyers also see that same information. So if they click on the issues tab on their view, they can see which items of yours are unverified and which ones are due to expire. Now, this screenshot is it's not the same supplier um, because there are a lot more unverified items, but I wanted to illustrate to you what it looks like when there are unverified items. What they can also see is whether or not you've submitted those particular sections and are waiting uh, for verification or waiting for assessment and the dates that you submitted that as well. So there's visibility across the board for the suppliers, uh, for, for the buyers. So now I've shown you what the buyers are interested in, what they look for when they source new suppliers. I've shown you what they see of your profile. And now I'm going to jump into the practical tips of what you can be doing to enhance your profile. So the first thing that I would suggest you all do is to look at your company profile. If you go into manage compliance and click on company profile, ask yourself the question, does it sell effectively sell what you do as a business? Is it a good elevator pitch for your company? Does it, does it accurately reflect your business and the work that you do? I see many businesses that don't have anything at all written in the company profile, no summary of the services. You know, in often case, there's such a wide variety of services that, that you offer. Uh, it's, it's important to sort of summarize that and present it to, to sell it to the buyers ultimately. We purposely ask you to check this information once a year. So, so we for, forcibly make it expire so that you can go in and check and make sure that this information is still up to date. Now, what you'll see from the screenshot is only the first four lines of that company profile is visible in the first instance. So what I would suggest is to keep the most important information within those first four lines and then any subsequent information below that fold so where you see the the, the word more um, people may not click through so just make sure the top information is it kind of covers everything that you need then you want to be checking your office locations and in particular, your areas of operations, they're two slightly different things. So your office locations are literally the addresses of your offices, and that may be your headquarters. It could be branch offices, local offices, depending on how big you are. The areas of operation go a little bit wider. So you may be, so I, I'm based in London, and typically what happens is people based in London may operate in some of the home counties. So they may operate in Surrey, in Kent, in Sussex. Maybe they go out into Essex or Hertfordshire, depending on what side of London. You know, most people don't like traveling through London, but that is a possibility. So the areas of operation are really important, and I'll show you in a little bit why that's the case. Then you want to check whether your primary contact is still in your business, whether the information in your primary contact is still up to date. I see very often, because we receive the bounce back messages, primary contacts, where we get bounce back messages and that contact is no longer valid. My team also reach out to the primary contacts to, to help get verified and to talk through their platform. And often those people have already left the business. Now that primary contact is the main person that the buyers have access to. So if that information is wrong or out of date, it may be the case that that buyer has tried to reach you, couldn't reach you, and then found the next person on their list where they have a valid primary contact. So it's important to keep this up to date. And again, we, we do ask you to check that information once a year. So once you get off this webinar, go and check these things in your profile. They're pretty easy to update. It's all in the identity section within your company profile. The next recommend recommendation from me is to review your work categories. And are they all verified? 
do they reflect every type of skill that you provide as a business? Now, having too few work categories may limit the likelihood of buyers finding you. Now, I was at the uh, Meet the Buyer event in London a little while back, and I was chatting with a supplier who was a tree surgeon. And quite correctly, they had tree surgery as one of their work categories. However, as we talked more, as I got to understand a little bit more about their business, I found out that they do quite a bit more than just tree surgery. They do landscaping, they do maintenance, grounds maintenance, all kinds of different um, services based around arboriculture. And so what we then did was we looked through our list of work categories. Now, this list of work categories is huge. It's like three and a half thousand work categories. And a quick control F for the word trees and uh, also landscaping. Um, we found a number of additional work categories that were 100% applicable to their business. So we found street trees and we also found landscaping and grounds maintenance that were also applicable for their business. So that gave them the power to go um, and, and add those work categories to their list. Now, the reason why it's important to not just have a single work category or very few is a buyer may think slightly differently about what terms they use to find the services that you offer. Now, I may be a buyer and I don't think of tree surgery. I might genuinely think of gardening or landscaping as the term that I might use when I'm searching for a supplier. Now, in that particular example for that supplier, had I searched for landscaping, they wouldn't have appeared because they didn't have landscaping as a work category. The other thing you want to do with your work categories is to make sure that for each work category, you have a contract amount that you have delivered for that type of service, because that can help the buyer get a picture of whether you as an organization are able to deliver on the size of those projects. Now, for those of you that have been with us for some time, you'll recall that uh, uh, quite a while ago, you had to provide references for every work category. Now, that is no longer the case. So you are able to probably apply more work categories than you were before because you don't require a reference from another organization for that work category. So you can add more work categories to your profile. And, and it, I would recommend going through our list. Now, um, that uh, FAQ, sorry, that, that list of work categories will be provided to you in the FAQ afterwards. Uh, or if you want to do a search on, uh, on our website, you'll, it's, it's available on the site. Uh, but we will share that list of, of work categories. The next thing to do is to get verified if you're not verified and to keep your verification status updated. Um, I really would suggest not letting anything become unverified because we are finding more and more that buyers are only interested in fully verified suppliers because they are the ones that pose the least risk to them because they can see the risk through the information provided in your profile. And keeping your profile up to date can be the difference between someone reaching out to you and including you in a tender and not. But we do know that it can be challenging to get verified. So we do have some services that can help you through that process. There are online checklists, uh, which again, we will provide uh, as a link. You can also schedule time with members of my team that will help guide you on what kind of documents you need. Um, there are a few areas that tend to catch people out and they can talk you through how to avoid falling into some of those pitfalls. And we do also have a much more in-depth uh, concierge service where they will go through every single step of the way to get you verified. And once you're verified, they will call you before anything becomes unverified. So you don't have to remember to go into the platform and update anything, they will call you and remind you that something needs to be updated. So if your insurances are coming up or your financials, they will contact you in advance and help handhold you through that entire process. The last thing here is social value. Now I touched upon it a little bit um, earlier, but because 
more of the larger buyers are now looking for companies that demonstrate their social value. We have included a question set specifically for social value. Now, a lot of you have already completed the question set, so it's fantastic uh, to see so many of you uh, actually uh, completing that social value question set. But those of you that haven't, have a look at the social value question set. It can really differentiate you from your leading competitor. Um, you know, if you are a gold verified supplier and so is your leading competitor and you don't have social value, but they do, that might just be the differentiator between a buyer reaching out to them and them reaching out to you. So in summary, the six things that you can do in your profile today to maximize the impact of your profile is update your company profile, that little elevator pitch for what you do as a business. Make sure that your locations, particularly your areas of location are up to date. Check that your primary contact is valid and a real person with a real email address that someone can reach out to. Review your work categories and make sure that they are up to date. Make sure that you get verified and then complete the social value question set. Now we've run through the key things that the buyers look for and what they can see of your profile, as well as those practical tips on updating your profile. Now, what I'd like to do here is to really tie everything together by explaining why it's important. So what's the point of what I've shown you? Now, one of our newest features is Marketplace uh, Publish. And um, Publish allows you to publish expressions of interest for private opportunities. And it is a way for our customers to source new suppliers or potentially notify existing suppliers on their supply chain of those potential opportunities. Now, the way Marketplace Publisher works is it uses a matching tool between location, work categories, and verification level. And when someone publishes an expression of interest, they specify where it's located, what kind of work is required of that, and any specific verification level that they require. And once they've set those criteria, the system matches those potential suppliers and then allows the individual company to publish the opportunity to those suppliers. Um, and then those suppliers can see those expressions of interest within the platform under marketplace track. So you, some of you may already have received invitations for expressions of interest for, from some of our buyers. Um, the example that you see on the screen at the moment is actually one from the National Trust um, for some electrical maintenance in Yorkshire. Now they specifically were looking for the area of operation of Yorkshire. They were looking for uh, electrical work categories, so they were looking across all of the different types of electrical uh, work that, that uh, our customers can um, provide. And once they published it, they published it to about 480 suppliers. Now, if a supplier didn't have a valid or verified work category that was within the electrical work categories, or they hadn't set their area of operation to be within Yorkshire, they won't have received this expression of interest. So some of you out there may be thinking, oh man, I do electrical work, I'm based in Yorkshire and I didn't receive this expression of interest. And, and if you go in, there may be reasons uh, as, as, as to why that's the case. Now, what's quite interesting with this particular expression of interest is they initially uh, so the, the National Trust required their suppliers to be verified to silver level. And in this case, they didn't actually specify silver when they originally published it because they wanted a broader range of uh, suppliers because they weren't sure how many responses they were going to get. Now, they ended up having quite a few responses. And so what they did was they then subsequently stopped the expression of interest they then uh, decided to contact only those that were already verified to silver. So there is definitely a benefit to getting verified with some of these instances. Now this feature has only been running for a few months, but we've already seen about 21 opportunities shared across about 7,000 suppliers so far. And it's only been, like I said, a couple of months. 
you will receive email notifications when someone does send you an expression of interest. So all you need to do is update your profile and then once an opportunity comes up, you'll be invited to it. The last thing I want to cover with you is Marketplace Find. Now, Marketplace Find is a feature that we've had available for about nine months now. And Marketplace Find is a single source of public sector tenders from um, the, the main public sector sites like OJEU and Contracts Finder. Uh, we also source uh, planning applications from about 400 local authority sites. Um, and ultimately what Marketplace Find is it pulls all of those together and speeds up the time for you having to go to each individual site to get those opportunities. We pull them all together into one particular place, um, uh, saving you hours of that time sourcing it. And we also, from, a, from a, um, an ROI perspective, have a higher ROI compared with other similar providers of, of services of this kind. Now, Marketplace Find has um, a knack to it. When you're using it, you have to be quite smart about how you set up your searches. So some of you may already have used it. Some of you, this may be the first time you're seeing it. When you set up searches, you can use either keywords or CPV codes, which are the, uh, the, the common procurement codes used across public sector sourcing. CPV codes can be very, very specific, as can keywords. In, in any case, there are different levels of uh, CPV code and keyword that you can use. Now, there's two ways you can do the searches. You can either set up a broad search term, which will give you a much wider pool of opportunities but it will also increase the chance of irrelevant opportunities, but it will decrease the chance of missing potential opportunities. The other alternative is to provide a slightly narrower search term and a smaller pool of opportunities. Ultimately, with a narrower set of terms, you'll see fewer irrelevant ops, but the likelihood of missing out on those excuse me, on those potential opportunities does start to increase. So there's a balance between the two. And let's just go through a kind of more practical example of this. So I did two searches. The one on the left, I just searched for gas in the United Kingdom, published in the last month. And it gave me 44 results. So 44 opportunities for the word gas. I then did a search for the word gas appliances and it gave me nine results. So you can see the difference. I've gone a little bit more specific with gas appliances. I've probably got nine results that are a bit more relevant, but what I may be doing is limiting the potential opportunities that are available to me. So I've highlighted one that might have suited the skills that I have but then it's weighing up, do you want to go through 44 opportunities and find that some of them are not relevant or potentially miss out on those opportunities but have fewer ones that you need to go through? And this will be completely personal preference around how you do business, how much time you have. You know, you may find, you know, you have a, a full workbook. So going through fewer opportunities that are more relevant is better. Knowing full well, you may miss the occasional opportunity. Um, we unfortunately don't control the opportunities and what information is, or in most cases, isn't added to the opportunity. We pull them straight in from their sources. So sometimes the data that sits in the background um, is not necessarily 100% correct because we, uh, we pull them straight from the sites. Um, we do get the occasional random opportunity from other countries pop in there. Um, so some of those things are being fixed as we go, as we see those opportunities, we're filtering those out. As long as you set the UK or a region within the UK, um, I've not seen any other random opportunities pop in and I have seen slightly more relevant opportunities um, depending on the published date and the deadline that I've put in there. You may also want to filter further based on contract size. So a little word of uh, caution if you are going to filter on, uh, on um, contract size. Sometimes they don't put any contract size at all in these opportunities. And if they don't, you will filter them out. So you won't even see them. So just be mindful of that as you're building your saved search. So as you 
as you build up the search, you're getting the right kind of results. Once you're happy with the filtering that you've got it right, remember to save your search. The reason why this is of benefit is that you don't have to keep logging in every day to check if there's new opportunities and doing the same search. Once you've saved it, we will notify you when there is a new, new opportunity that meets that criteria. So these opportunities are literally coming through daily. They're updated pretty much on, you know, uh, you know, within re uh, real time. So the moment there is an opportunity, the following day you'll receive a notification with that new opportunity through email. And you can set those notifications to be sent daily, weekly, or, or, or turn them off altogether. All so really, really important to save your search. Now, hopefully what I've gone through with you today, you will take some benefit and you'll be able to go and implement uh, through uh, into your profile straight away. Um, the, uh, I can see there's definitely been questions in the QA. I can't see the QA myself, but I can see this fair few coming through. Um, there are a few different things that um, I'd like to just finish off with, which is um, where um, can I find the list of work categories? Um, where can I find and update my company profile? Oh. There we go. I'm not sure what's happened then. Hopefully you, could, you were able to see my video through that. Um, it hadn't popped up um, until just now that I had turned my video off. Um, but where can I find the list of, uh, of work categories? Um, so we will share that list with, with everyone uh, once this, uh, this webinar has finished. You can update your profile and your identity section uh, in your identity section. And along with that, you can do your office information, your areas of operation and your primary contacts. Um, there are plenty of documentation ready on our site um, to uh, actually um, uh, help you with getting verified. Um, if you want to access Marketplace Find, um, if you go in, if you log into your platform, you can see Marketplace Find on the left-hand side of the menu. And if you want to uh, schedule a call with a customer success team to help you get verified, we will share the link with you afterwards if my team hasn't already done so. Um, and there is a full list of CPV codes. There are thousands of them um, on one of the EU sites, which we will share with you. Um, it's a pretty easy PDF to search for the key terms and you can find the CPV code that goes alongside it. Um, so uh, have there been uh, any other questions that are worth answering or worth addressing at this point? Um, so quite a lot of them are relevant to things like CPV codes, um, but more so around the view of what we were seeing on the slides. So I tried to explain that this was a view of the buyer side only because we wanted to show you what the buyers see, depending on what you do and don't complete on your profile. Um, there's some of those. Yeah. So the other thing, so on the screen, you'll see um, the uh, email address success at constructionline.co.uk. Now, um, hopefully my team has been able to answer your question as we've, uh, questions as we've gone along, but inevitably, as is always the case, you'll close this chat and you'll remember a question that you want to ask. So jot this email down. If you drop us an email, we will route your email through to your customer success manager who can then either give you a call or answer your email with any questions that you have. They can get into a bit more of the specifics that I've covered today and show you individually on your on your profile some of these things. So if you do have anything that you want to follow up with, use this email address and we'll get um, uh, we'll get answers to your questions. Um, but I really do appreciate you bearing with me. It's it is quite hot today uh, uh, across the country uh, and I've been going on for, for, for quite a while. So appreciate your time. Um, and I do have a webinar that I'm running in a few weeks time on publisher specifically. So for those of you that do have subcontractors, I will be running a session on how you can leverage that functionality to source new sub subcontractors um, and fill in some of the gaps within your supply chain. So watch this space for uh, invitations to that webinar. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Lily. Just like to remind everyone that this recording will be sent to everyone after the webinar too. Thanks all.